everyone. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Lord Mayor, welcome to the Finance and Business 2030 event here in the City of London. I think the SDG that is most important to me is industry innovation and infrastructure. It's really about leveraging technology uh, to create sustainable solutions. The finance business community can make its biggest contribution by actually recognising that climate change is the biggest issue facing the planet at the moment. This event is great because it's a great opportunity to bring people together to talk about the issues that affect us on a global level. The financial community are the gatekeepers. They hold the keys to ending corruption. And that would be the best thing they could do for the world. The Sustainable Development Goals set by the UN are not a nice to have, they're an absolute must on the agenda and I look forward to seeing what some of South Africa's brightest young minds come up with as we launch the task force for Finbus 2050 in South Africa. The, the, the talking is necessary at the beginning to stimulate the debate but uh, the value of this session will be on the specific actions that these leaders will commit to taking forward to improve things in South Africa. The single greatest leader the world has ever seen came from this country. days of looking back and saying someone else has to do it is over and you look at I look at the young people who are immigrating out of the country and I say why you know we are the ones who can fix it we are the ones who can do the change and it's time we stop looking around and realize that we are the change that we need at right now this is a fantastic initiative and it's already delivery and that's the business of the day delivery Hello everyone, good afternoon. On behalf of the Lord Mayor, welcome to the Finance and Business 2030 event here in the City of London. I think the SDG that is most important to me is industry innovation and infrastructure. It's really about leveraging technology uh, to create sustainable solutions. The finance and business community can make its biggest contribution by actually recognising that climate change is the biggest issue facing the 
planet at the moment. This event is great because it's a great opportunity to bring people together to talk about the issues that affect us on a global level. The financial community are gatekeepers. They hold the keys to ending corruption. And that would be the best thing they could do for the world. The sustainable development goals set by the UN are not a nice to have, they're an absolute must on the agenda and I look forward to seeing what some of South Africa's brightest young minds come up with as we launch the task force for FINBIS 2030 in South Africa. The, the, the talking is necessary at the beginning to stimulate the debate but uh, the value of this session will be on the specific actions that these leaders will commit to taking forward to improve things in South Africa. The single greatest leader the world has ever seen came from this country. The days of looking back and saying someone else has to do it is over and you look at I look at people who are immigrating out of the country and I say why you know we are the ones who can fix it we are the ones who can do the change and it's time we stop looking around and realize that we are the change that we need at right now this is a fantastic initiative and it's already delivering and that's the business of the day delivery Hello everyone, good afternoon. On behalf of the Lord Mayor, welcome to the Finance and Business 2030 event here in the City of London. I think the SDG that is most important to me is industry innovation and infrastructure. It's really about leveraging technology uh, to create the solutions. The finance and business community can make its biggest contribution by actually recognising that climate change is the biggest issue facing the planet at the moment. This event is great because it's a great opportunity to people together to talk about the issues that affect us on a global level. The financial community are the gatekeepers. They hold the keys to ending corruption. And that would be the best thing they could do for the world. The sustainable development goals set by the UN are not a nice to have, they're an absolute must on the agenda 
and I look forward to seeing what some of South Africa's brightest young minds come up with as we launch the task force for FinBiz 2030 in South Africa. The, the, the talking is necessary at the beginning to stimulate the date, but uh, the value of this session will be on the specific actions that these leaders will commit to taking forward to improve things in South Africa. The single greatest leader the world has ever seen came from this country. days of looking back and saying someone else has to do it is over and you could look at the young people who are immigrating out of the country and I say why you know we are the ones who can fix it we are the ones who can do change and it's time we stop looking around and realize that we are the change that we need at right now this is a fantastic initiative and it's already delivering and that's the business of the day delivery Hello everyone, good afternoon. On behalf of the Lord Mayor, welcome to the Finance and Business 2030 event here in the City of London. I think the SDG that is most important to me is industry innovation and infrastructure. It's really about leveraging technology uh, to create sustainable solutions. The finance and business community can make its big contribution by actually recognising that climate change is the biggest issue facing the planet at the moment. This event is great because it's a great opportunity to bring people together to talk about the issues that affect us on a global level. The financial community are the gatekeepers. They hold the keys to ending corruption. And that would be the best thing they could do for the world. The Sustainable Development Goals set by the UN are not a nice to have, they're an absolute must on the agenda and I look forward to seeing what some of South Africa's brightest young minds come up with as we launch the task force for FinBiz 2030 in South Africa. The, the, the talking is necessary at the beginning to stimulate the debate, but uh, the value of this session will be on the specific actions that these leaders will commit to taking forward to improve things in South Africa. The single greatest leader the world has ever seen came from 
this country. Days of looking back and saying someone else has to do it is over. And you look at I look at the young people who are immigrating out of the country, and I say, why? You know, we are the ones who can fix it. We are the ones who can do the change. And it's time we stop looking around and realize that we are the change that we need at right now. This is a fantastic initiative, and it's already delivering. And that's the business of the day: delivery. Welcome everyone to the first Finance and Business 2030 event of 2021, part of the Building Resilience series hosted today by the International Federation of Accountants, also known as IFAC, and American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, known as the AICPA. My name is Carla Futch, and I'm a One Young World Ambassador and a VP at Goldman Sachs. I am joined today alongside the wonderful Shalene Gallagher. Thank you, Carla. I'm thrilled to be here today in my day job. I'm Regulatory Data Senior Associate at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and an advocate for gender equality and reduced inequities experienced by minority groups. That being said, the opinions I share today are my own and are not the opinion of the Federal Reserve Board or the system. It's amazing to see how many people have joined us today. We have about 1,500 registrants from over 96 countries and it's just amazing to have you all here joining us today. For those of you who don't know, Finance and Business 2030 or FinBiz 2030 is an initiative led by One Young World and Chartered Accountants Worldwide. Their mission is to unite and mobilize leaders across these two sectors to tackle the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And they do this through the FinBiz 2030 task forces that are operational around the world. There are FinBiz task forces up and running in the UK, South Africa, Ireland, and soon Nigeria, with over 70 talented young leaders driving forward impactful initiatives. We will be launching our very own task force here in the US very soon. So for those of you who are interested in getting involved, we will give you further information after the event. The FinBiz 2030 team created the Building Resilience series out of a need to address the collective share challenges that have been amplified by the pandemic. And today we'll be focusing on the business case for doing good. In today's world, the way in which companies use natural resources, employ their workforces and position themselves in the face of critical societal issues will affect performance, access to capital and long-term value creation. 
there isn't just a moral imperative for businesses and organizations to behave responsibly, but a financial one as well. It just makes sense for businesses to do good. Awesome. So today we will be hearing from six excellent speakers who will each bring their unique expertise to give you a holistic view of this topic and share actionable tips. You can scroll down to see the full list and their bios. They're really an impressive bunch. For the first hour, we'll hear from our guests and then we will extend the session by 15 minutes for a Q&A after party. For those of you who wanna hear more from our experts. But first, we wanna to get to know our participants a little more. We will be asking you three questions. Shalene and I are gonna go through the questions. They'll pop up on the screen. You can give us your answer. After we go through some housekeeping items, we'll tell you guys the results of the questions. So let's start with question number one. So question one, how much do you know about the sustainable development goals? Your options are, I'm very familiar, I have a basic understanding, or I haven't heard of them at all. All right, our second question is, how much support do you have in your organization to drive sustainability initiatives forward? Do you have a high level of support, you receive some support, or no support? Perfect. And our final question, how motivated are you to drive sustainability initiatives forward? You have four options. You're either highly motivated, you're interested, but you're unsure where to start, it's on your radar, or you're not motivated at all. Perfect. All right. Before we hear from our speakers, we have some housekeeping notes, as Carla mentioned, just to run through. For those of you having any issues with bandwidth, you can lower the resolution of your stream on your computer so that you can see and hear us better. Please continue to use the chat function to drop in any comments and questions you have for specific speakers throughout the session, because we'd love to hear from you. And we also ask that you close all of the tabs on your browser and turn your phone on silent so that you can fully engage and participate in today's session. We do, however, encourage you to share your thoughts, quotes, or favorite moments from today's event on social media by adding the hashtag FinBiz2030 and tagging us in your posts. The slide you're seeing right now gives you our ads, so please use those and tag us as you post. Please stick with us for the next hour. There's lots of amazing content coming your way, but first, let's get to the results of our polling questions so that we can learn more about you. Thank you, Shalene. All right, so we have our first question, which is how much do you know about the sustainable development goals? So let's see our answers here. So about 54%, it's still moving, about 54% have a basic understanding, about 29% are very familiar, and the rest of you have not heard of them at all. So if you haven't heard of them, I'm gonna give you a little spiel just so that you become a little more familiar, um, but please feel free to look the sustainable development goals up after because um, they drive a lot of our agenda forward. So for those of you who don't know, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all of the United Nations members in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. At its heart are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries developed and developing in a global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. So hopefully that made you a little more comfortable with the SDGs, but again, please feel free to look them up. Thank you, Carla. And now we're gonna go on to our second polling question, which just as a reminder asks how much support you receive in your organization to drive sustainability initiatives forward. So looking at this, it's about 57-ish percent, not wearing my glasses today, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, high level of support is about in the 20s and no support is about 14%. So based on the conversation that we have today, we hope that you're able to gain some tools and some insights on how you can kind of engage others in your organization to try and get that support and to seek it out in and outside of your organization so that you could drive these SDGs forward. Awesome, thanks Shalene. You can tell we both need glasses because I'm sitting here like reading the screen <laughs> with my tiny eyes. But our third and final question. 
So how motivated are you to drive sustainability initiatives forward? So we have four answers here. I'm so glad to see that most of you are highly motivated. I am as well. Um, and so are all of our speakers you will soon see. So 47% are highly motivated. 40% are interested, but you're unsure where to start. Hopefully you will see today, maybe get an idea of where you can start. 12% it's on your radar and 1% you're not motivated at all. Totally understand. I think we all need some kickstarts to start our motivation. So totally, hopefully today that will do that for you. So it was really interesting to get to know you all. Thank you for answering our questions. Um, and we hope that this event helps you on your journey to your next stage. Now, it would not be a FinBiz webinar without a welcome from Kate Robertson, our One Young World visionary co-founder and CEO. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Carla, and I have, I have so many thank yous, but I just want to take 30 seconds to thank you for all of your advocacy and your work, and also Raven as well. Thank you, Shaleen, so much for co-hosting. How impressive to have a young star from the Federal Reserve. That's just, just something really amazing. I um, also want to thank Status Gould from IFAC, Paul Parks from AICPA. Paul, I know you're on here. I can actually see you. And of course, wonderful Michael Itzo, who really is, is the person who's is led this from the get-go. And of course, Ruth Hidalgo, without whom none of this would happen. So straight in on it, and you've, you've had your questions today. Um, simply to say this, and this is the importance of FinBiz, the importance of FinBiz. Whatever we think about the sustainable development goals or whenever we think about them, we have to know all over the world and in every single country, if we don't know how to count, account for and audit what we're doing, there is no progress. This is all going to go wrong. And this is where this, um, this overarching global concept as Michael Itza and Ruth Hidalgo saw it, is the importance of everybody who's in finance and accounting is to understand that you will be the ones who account for the progress, leave alone drive the, con the progress. Without you, there is no progress. And I often have um, young professionals saying to me, um, I've got a really good job at one of the big four accountancy firms or in a bank, for example, saying to me, but I really feel I want to go and save the world and, and help people. And I'm thinking I'm going to go and work for an NGO, which is great. But we need to know, the world needs to know that the best people with the best intentions, especially regarding sustainability, are actually in the finance and accounting professions. It is really as simple as that. It cannot be that we would look at those professions and say, okay, only the crooks are there because then we're all doomed. So on sustainability, I think the thing that is critical for this group is this understanding. This thing has moved. In my lifetime, but certainly even in the last two years, the sustainability rocket has just taken off. There is a, a broader global understanding now, as I see it in the global CEOs that I know from some of the biggest businesses in the world, there is an understanding that everything you do, supply chain, your people, everything you do in private sector world has to these days be sustainable. You want your business to be able to continue to grow. You want your consumers to still be there. You want them to be alive and healthy. You want the world to still be there ultimately. That is what sustainability is about. Sustainability is not about as we used to call it, um, some siloed sort of thing where you park a bit of, a bit of your profits and, and, and maybe it does some good and maybe it doesn't, and then we'll just see. That is not what sustainability is about. And sustainability should not be confined to what my generation used to look at as sort of green tree huggy sorts of things. That is not what sustainability is about. As Carla said, and Shaleen was saying in the introduction to the sustainable development goals, this framework covers everything good. Everything good that needs to be sorted out in the world today is listed there under the 17 goals and the 139 clauses within that. But what that says is, 
Every aspect of our business and personal lives is covered in that. So every single thing done could make a difference. But the sustainable development goals are not about small personal, hey, when I go out of the room, I switch the light off. No, the sustainable development goals demand a scale of change that is almost beyond our imagining. On slavery alone, Grace Forrest, who is an Australian One Year World Ambassador, did the math and worked out that for the ending of slavery to be um, contemporary with 2030, over 300,000 people need to be freed from slavery every week. So the sustainable development goals are asking us for big stuff, big minds, big brains and brave stuff, but in every single aspect of, of our lives. In business, you have to know the businesses that are cracking sustainability in every part of their activity are the businesses that are doing better than anybody else. So the business case is absolutely straight up a golden opportunity for businesses, for governments. This is changing. As we speak, we see that, for example, the on cost of carbon has gone from $40 or $30 per the Obama um, administration reckoning to over $100. This is the scale of change. So saving carbon now has, is getting a serious value put on it that only business understands. But if we can't bring FinBiz to overseeing and guiding the world through this, then we leave a vacuum for bad players. And that is not what LEAD 2030 is, what 2030 Sustainable Development Goals is about. What it's about is space for the good people. So I have to think, given the numbers that Carla and Shaleen were showing at the beginning, that highly motivated at 47% is a damn good stat. 40% saying, where do I start? It's straight up. In your business, there will be a drive towards sustainability. Tomorrow matters, but we have to do the work now, today. And that's for FinBiz. So congratulations to all of you. It's wonderful to see you. I will be staying on and, and, and listening. With, with pride and excitement and looking for ideas and looking at these brilliant young stars. And again, thank you to everyone for putting this together. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Shaleen, Paul, Michael, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Kate. You always set us off on the right foot. And I know that I speak for every life that you've ever touched about how much admiration I have for you as a person. Um, I always feel so energized and motivated when I hear from you. And I know for a fact, if we did the poll after you did that, we would have no percentages on not motivated at all. So <laughs> I'm sure everyone is feeling very motivated. Um, Shaleen, why don't you introduce our next speaker? Thank you, Carla. And thank you, Kate, so much for that in introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Paul Parks, who's the Director of Management Accounting at AICPA and one of today's co-hosts. He has years of technical experience under his belt, having worked for startups, multinationals, public companies, private companies. He's done it all, really. Um, Paul is deeply embedded in the changing accounting landscape and is here to share his wisdom with us all. So thank you and over to you, Paul. Thank you, Shalane. Um, we're very excited to support this effort in the United States. Uh, when Chartered Accountants Worldwide and One Young World reached out to us, we, we jumped at the chance. Uh, so what we're talking about here today is the business case for sustainability, okay, and the implementation of SDGs. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock last year said, I believe we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. We believe sustainability should be our new standard for investing. When the largest investment firm in the world says, I believe we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance, it got our attention, okay? And it's getting a lot of attention in the US. We work with a lot of constituents all around the world. Uh, we're AICPA, SEMA. Uh, uh, I think in other parts of the world, some of these movements are ahead of where we are, but I think uh, we're gonna catch up very quick now. Uh, 
followed layering on the business round table uh, that 181 CEOs uh, committed to leading their company for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, uh, uh, communities, in addition to the shareholders. That's a significant move in kind of how we view the nature of a corporation. Okay, and I'm going to get into some of the business case issues in just a second. Regulators around the world are now uh, uh, going out consultations about climate disclosure and ESG agenda. Uh, the investors want to know more. Okay, and in fact, last uh, last week, the United States Security and Exchange Commission announced a consultation, a 90-day consultation on this. That's followed right behind the announcement. They're they're assembling a task force for enforcement. To make sure that the company, the public companies in the U.S. are adequately disclosing uh, ESG issues and particularly uh, environmental risk and things of that nature, this movement has power behind it. Okay, the momentum is building, and there's much more than just about the environment. Uh, sustain sustainability has always been about long-term value creation. Okay, and I'll ask you add long-term resilience and value creation particularly as we kind of think about what's happened over the last year. It's a move from a short-term focus to more managing the business for the long term. And it's about managing the company for all stakeholders. It's a move from shareholder primacy to managing the business for all stakeholders. Okay. And we as financial uh, uh, professionals need to embrace these calls to action. Our profession needs to lean into this and recognize the opportunity that it provides for true leadership. Okay. Investments in sustainable goals. Uh, is sustainable growth, managing the business for the long term, taking uh, care of the needs of all stakeholders does enhance long term shareholder value. It doesn't hurt it. OK, and there's research that shows that short term focus in turn can actually harm long term value creation. And so. We're going to get in our speakers going to talk a lot about about this, and I'm really looking forward to it. But at the end of the day, climate risk is just that. It's a financial risk. Uh, diversity, you know, diversity leads to innovation. An engaged, passionate, empowered workforce can drive innovation. Collaborative innovation, working with your suppliers and customers can re result in huge financial returns. And an excellent reputation leads to loyal customers. Okay. And you say, well, what is our role as finance people? This is all in our wheelhouse. We're talking about risk uh, management, scenario planning, corporate reporting, business planning. Return on investment, serving as a partner to the business. This is what we did. Okay. And you can make a difference. Start with building awareness within your organization about the calls to action and the business case for investing in the ESG agenda. And ultimately let your passion show through. I think it will make a difference. And I think there's opportunities, uh, significant opportunities for you as an individual in your career uh, and also for the business uh, to kind of change its focus. So, with that said, I'm looking forward to our panel and our speakers, and I'll hand it back to you, Shalane. Thank you, Paul. I mean, everything you said really resonated with me, truth be told, very much thinking about the fact that long-term value creation must be partnered with resilience. We have to think about things from the perspective of all our stakeholders, not just our shareholders, and that's something we as finance and business professionals are in a very, very unique place to be able to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for painting the backdrop for the business case for doing good. And Carla, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Shalane. And thank you so much, Paul. We will now be hearing from three leaders who have decades of combined experience in finance and business advisory, each of whom will deliver a fire starting keynote. Their speeches will then be followed by a panel, and don't forget, we have a subsequent Q&A after party the 15 minutes after the event. So make sure to drop all of your questions into the chat. I am thrilled and so excited to be welcoming our first keynote speaker, Mara Hodge, who is an audit partner and national ESG assurance leader at KPMG's Boston office. With years of sustainability experience under her belt, she is behind much of the firm's sustainability and ESG work please scroll down and make sure to read her bio and all of the bios of our speakers today. She's accomplished so much in her career. Over to you, Mara. Thanks, Carla. And thank you everybody for joining today. I'm really honored to be here and to be able to share a little bit of my story with you. Now, ever since I was young, I believe strongly about using my time, talents, and treasures in order to, both in my personal and professional life, to help alleviate some of the pain and suffering that I saw in the world around me. 
And so I thought in college that focusing on and working with nonprofit organizations was the way to do that. I um, was working with our community service office and of course ran into needing to work through fundraising and meeting with companies and asking for donations. And through that process and through those conversations, it, it dawned on me how much corporations control or direct a lot of the natural and human resources of this world. And so that's what turned me on to having a career in business. But of course, you know, you have this high level vision about what you want to do and where you want to go. And you really have to drill down into the details and make some decisions. And so the first thing I wrestled with was what major will I have and what career do I want? And at the moment when I was trying to come to a conclusion on that, uh, I remember listening to the radio and hearing about the Enron scandal and hearing about the lives that were devastated and the livelihoods that were lost because of the bad actions and the, the deception of just a couple of people. And that really turned me on to an auditing career and that's how I ended up at KPMG. But when I moved to KPMG, I thought, you know, I'll be there for five years. I'm going to learn some skills and, and understand how companies work and how finance works. And then I'll go and work for a corporation and, and work on the measurement component of sustainability. I think, and I still believe that being able to measure the impact, whether it's from a financial or non-financial perspective is absolutely critical in driving and in changing behavior. You both have to understand the dollar investments that need to be made and then the outcomes that those investments are making in order to ensure that companies and people are still continuing to move in the same direction and in order to address a lot of the sustainable development goals that, that we're thinking about today. But um, in 2010, when I came to that, that point in my career where I thought maybe I'll go try something else, an opportunity arose uh, for me to be able to start up our assurance practice around sustainability in the United States. I was able to draw on the methodologies and the good work that had been done internationally, but I needed to bring it to a US market and understand the risks as well as the standards that were applicable in the US. It was a lot of hard work. Um, I spent two years working on it and thought that it was something that I was going to spend the rest of my career doing. Um, but two years later, when, when I decided to make the switch, I realized there actually was not enough business to keep me busy 100% of the time. And so I decided to stay in audit, but had the opportunity to build our early stage life sciences practice. And through that was working with companies that were raising money to do research and development on drugs and technologies that would change um, and, and cure some of the world's worst diseases. So I was still connected to um, you know, some of my passions and, and being able to make a difference in the world, but was still really focused on trying to use sustainability and trying to use that reporting aspect to, to drive change. And as Paul had talked about, we fast forward to early 2020 and the term ESG is on everybody's lips within the corporate world. And so now I have the opportunity to draw on those experiences that I've had over the past decade to really push change both within KPMG as well as across all of the services that we offer as a firm. If you think about the different things that we do outside of audit, we have valuation specialists, we have people who work on deals that need to build ESG considerations into those deals. We have people who look at processes and controls and help to build the rigor around that, that data that's coming out. And so everything that we do as a firm can definitely have an ESG lens on it. And I'm working really hard to understand how we bring everybody together. And success for me looks like understanding and, and having everybody within our firm focused on these really important issues and understanding how they're built into their day-to-day -day work. So with that, I'd really like to leave you with three things that you can consider and hopefully practice in whatever work that you're doing today. The first, know your purpose. Start small, pick one SDG that you're really passionate about and develop a vision around that. But then don't just leave it there. You need to translate it into actionable steps. Break it down and know what, what you're going to be doing. From there, you can leverage your skills in your network. Share your vision with others and understand how they fit within it and work together on those steps to make a difference. And finally, don't give up. The time is now. Even if you've been working on this for a long time or, or you're just starting to, to get into it, 
You're going to face challenges. You're going to face mountains and valleys, but learn from those challenges, learn how to change your message, learn how to speak to people who might be giving you a hard time and keep at it because it is all worth it. So thank you for letting me share my story with you. And I'm really excited to hear from the others. Thank you so much, Mara. I think one of the most important things that I think you talk about is that people often think they need to leave their corporate jobs in order to make an impact in sustainability. Um, and you're a perfect example of why you don't always have to leave. There are so many roles that either might exist or might not exist in your companies. And if they don't, make it exist. Have them care about sustainability and apply for those roles. So thank you so much for giving us that motivation. If you have any questions, please make sure to drop them in the q and I know I have a ton for her already, but make sure to drop them in the Q&A um, so that we can ask them in that after party session. All right, thank you, Carla. And thank you so much, Maura. Now we're gonna hear from Gareth Parkin, who is the Vice Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the industrial gases company, Mercer Industries. Gareth is much younger than your typical CFO profile. And with that, he brings a refreshing perspective and approach to building the business case for doing good. Originally from the UK, he's joining us from his home in New Jersey. I'm sure that you will have many questions for him. So like Carla mentioned, please ensure to leave them in the chat box for our Q&A later today. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, Charlene. That was too much of a glowing intro. I'm definitely the gray haired <laughs> member of the panel today, but um, I've tried to earn those gray hairs across the last few years. Um, having worked in a number of different continents and countries uh, and in the industrial gases business that I've been in, I get to see a number of end markets, segments and mega trends. Each of those boil down to a couple of basics. And for me, the reason that I entered into a financial role and the reason that I'm still incredibly passionate about um, everything that particularly FinBiz and more broadly the organizations can do is because we as financial leaders have a perfect opportunity to shape a corporation and to shape the future. We are the strategic partner and leader in a business in every sense. Now today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the business case. That is obviously the, the technical nuts and bolts of it. But if I pick up on what Paul said, it really boils down to this shareholder value creation. Okay, a wonderful grand term. What on earth does it really mean? Okay, to me, that is all about increasing the quality of earnings. Quality of earnings is about sustainable, resilient impact. That does not always mean it has to be the highest margin, the highest yield, because we've got to think generations ahead, not just years ahead when you're talking about the PL. The biggest daily consideration I would say I have in my role and in the industry I work in is how you deploy capital, how you deploy that in the smartest, most efficient way. That is one of the key things we as financial and business partners can really start to move on and think about our portfolio. How do we start to increase the amount of spend and deploy capital in those sustainable objectives? And lastly, and Paul picked up on this, I couldn't agree even more, but shareholders and stakeholders are not just people who own a share certificate. My daily job and more than 50% of my time is dealing with and considering all of the stakeholders of the business. And that is anyone and everyone who has a connection with my product, my services, my community that I service in directly and indirectly. So that holistic picture and trying to take a bigger step out of the daily grind and products and services that you offer really has been the advancement and beyond you know, the amplification that we've seen through 2020, still the issues and significant impact that we're seeing today around uh, the COVID pandemic and other social activities. This is feeding into daily corporate life. So again, I, I touch on something Kate said, you know, probably two, three years ago, a corporation's ESG agenda, it, it was an option. Um, you had regulatory filings, but really, if you wanted to advance in that, it was for a few predominantly kind of B2C style corporations. Today, it's not an option, it's an obligation and is absolutely everywhere. It is embedded in everything that I see, I do and I touch. And even again, as, as today under Mesa, you know, we're a privately owned, highly leveraged company, but it is an embedded part of my credit rating. It's an embedded part of what my investors want to understand in terms of how much am I investing in sustainable initiatives for their own portfolio, as well as for mine. So whichever way you look at this, um, it is there, it is on us, it's not coming, it's right on top of us. 
And what we're also seeing from an economic perspective, we are absolutely on the cusp of really starting to launch um, segments and trends that are going to deliver true economic value and a step change that have real sustainable impact. If I give you a specific example in the US, one that's close to my heart, if I look at the decarbonization economy, and even specifically underneath that hydrogen mobility, we are on the cusp of that now. That is not a pipe dream. It was something that probably a few years ago, it kind of was a little touchy-feely. It had to be backed by governments, not anymore. It is going to be a part of the step change. And if you're positioned to that from a corporation perspective, again, the quality of your earnings, the sustainability of that will be there for decades to come. So kind of boiling that down, my key things for you to consider, and really kind of looking at this from a business case. So a traditional business case and a business case for doing good are not mutually exclusive. They're absolutely one in the same, but you just need to sometimes think about particularly some of these larger investments in a slightly different way. So number one, you've got to think long-term, okay? If you're trying to put a large economic investment for sustainable growth in place, it goes beyond a traditional contract term that many of your companies might enact. We're talking here, and, and my time window is probably at least 25 years, if not 35, 40 years in advance. So it's not a contract, it's a generation or two ahead. And with that, you need to kind of shift the mindset and, and shift the thinking a little. The second thing is to look at how you can look to lower capital costs and risk. This is always one of the biggest things I'm brought. Um, these projects won't hit me. Hurdle rate, they look too expensive. How do we take an opportunity of that? We'll look to partner up with people, share some of the technology risk, share some of the financial risk. You'll hear from a colleague of mine uh, next, you know, just in terms of what you can do with a number of bonds and opportunities coming up in the financial space. And again, with economic development, there are still a number of tax breaks and incentives at a federal or state level because all of these jobs have sustainability, they create opportunities, and that is recognised and there's value to be taken there as well. So think about those. And lastly, by no means least, it's very easy, and I say this from personal experience as a CFO, you look at the risk. Okay, that is your job. You're there to kind of govern. Again, it's part of the financial remit. You're there to keep security and governance. But with that, don't just look at the risks. Look at the strategic opportunities. Again, I can tell you from firsthand experience that investment in sustainable development has more strategic upside than you could possibly imagine at the point you make that investment. It unlocks a huge amount of potential in the future and it unlocks doors both from a reputational perspective and from an experience perspective that enter into spaces that will absolutely grow and develop and be future uh, revenue streams for your corporation to come in the future. So with that, at least if you cannot value that in a traditional business style sense, at least look to put that on the table and to be able to set that vision, set that tone and allow people to see the doors and the corridors that that could open. Again, I, I give you just a, a small example uh, around hydrogen mobility. Five or six years ago, uh, I was making investment decisions on hydrogen fuel cell stations uh, out in California. I was lucky if they wiped their face. That was my main premise to make sure that I didn't lose value, but I definitely wasn't going to earn or create any value. As I stand today, having gone through that from a corporation perspective, we know how to deploy that technology. We know how to run and utilize those assets. And as I said, now on the cusp of this decarbonization economy, we are positioned both reputationally, technically, and financially to look to capitalize on that. I didn't see that as a bet five years ago. It was an entry into a market. And now we've got a, a, a new trend and a new opportunity to open up a PSO for the next 50 years to come, which if we hadn't made that investment and thought a little bit more strategically in long term, we'd be locked out of now permanently. So hopefully that's given you some food for thought. I'd love to get your questions, so please put them in the chat. Let me know anything that else I can uh, help you with with that. Otherwise, I'll hand over to our hosts. Thanks. Thank you, Gareth. I mean, thank you so much for your insights and your reflections on this topic and the themes that we're hearing about long-term focus. It's generational. It's not today. It, you're thinking 30, 40 years from now, managing capital costs and risks and trying to bring that down. And also when we think about things from a governance perspective, it's not just thinking about risks. It's not a glass half empty type scenario. It's a glass half full. 
we have to think about the opportunities and we have to balance that with everything that we're thinking about as an organization and setting that tone from the top. So thank you, thank you for that. And to our attendees, please do stick around for the panel later on and enter your questions in the Q&A as Gareth mentioned and as all our guests mentioned because we want to engage with you. We want to answer your questions as best we can. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carla to introduce our next guest. Thank you so much, Shalene, and thank you so much, Gareth. You're definitely a force to be reckoned with, so I'm excited to hear more about, uh, about you during the panel. All right, so our uh, next guest, jo joining us all the way from Mongolia to give us a global perspective, we have Nomandari Engther, who is the CEO of the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Association, a portfolio management consultant for the UN Joint SDG Fund, and a fellow One Young World Ambassador. She's a truly impressive finance professional, a driving force behind the sustainability agenda in Mongolia and beyond. I personally can't wait to hear from her. Nomandari, over to you. Many thanks, Carla. Just checking in to see if you can hear me okay. Yeah, I hear you great. Okay, great, perfect. And thank you very much for the warm welcome and the introduction. It's a really absolute pleasure for me to be here, and I'm really excited to speak about the story of how in Mongolia, it's a, it's a developing small country of only 3 million people, but we're able to use the banking sector really as a driver for change and sustainability in the country. And I'm hoping to also bring a little bit of a developing country perspective uh, in this discussion today. So I think everyone already agreed that uh, if you look at what's happening globally now, the majority of businesses and the policymakers are speaking about sustainability, climate change, sustainable business practices. As just looking at the recent kind of survey that said around 70 to 80% of the global organizations had already made commitments to, for example, reduce the GHG emissions. And another one and a half thousand companies are currently committed to TCFD and climate disclosure standards, which is definitely a tremendous achievement. And uh, we are seeing similar kind of headlines every day in the news about these kind of exciting developments towards uh, our 2030 agenda. Um, however, the real challenge that I believe we are facing right now is to really demonstrate the credibility of these commitments and really making sure that um, the actual change is happening and actual money is actually flowing into projects that are more cleaner and more sustainable. And I really must say that although we are making progress, I, I think we're still way far behind where we need to be and where our commitments um, uh, we have made uh, should be. And one of the reasons I think this is happening is, is because there's still many countries and companies that are viewing climate change, sustainability as kind of a side initiative, you know, a, a social responsibility activity, something that's nice to do. Um, you just follow it because the rest of the industry does it, whereas it should be incorporated really in the cost strategies of any business that has a long term vision. And as a metaphor, we're just celebrating Earth Day one day a year, whereas every day should be Earth Day. And we could really endlessly debate the merits and costs of benefits of sustainability regulations and business practices. But at the end, we just have to understand it, it's just probably the most profitable strategy of human history. And sustainability should be just our new norm, new present and new business as usual. Um, I think it was said it should be the new investment standards. And the kind of the realization of this really has formed the sustainable finance journey in Mongolia. So in 2013, we had all the CEOs of the, of the banks come together when we had the first sustainable finance forum. And we had a long discussion about the various environmental, social um, issues the country is facing. I mean, a lot of people, when we talk about Mongolia, we think about the nomadic country with the blue sky. But the reality is that we face a lot of issues like air pollution, which is even worse than Beijing, climate change, health, safety, destruction of, of the lands from the mining sector and so on. And in a country where the enforcement of environmental regulations is, is really weak because of the government and often also subject to corruption, the banking sector, the financial sector in general, holds a really powerful position uh, to influence more sustainable business practices. And most of the CEOs, when we had the discussion around that, they fully agreed that they had to implement sustainability because the banking sector has a really critical role in the economy. It makes up 95% of the entire financial sector. So it's a quite strong, advanced sector, and they usually want to take a lead in these initiatives rather than being told by the government to do, you know, to, to do something or to implement a policy. But one of the other CEOs like in, in the room put 
uh, in a very different way and said the question of why we should do sustainable finance should not really be discussed today because the answer is very simple. We are just doing it to survive. We simply cannot succeed in, in a world that itself is failing. And the sustainability path is just an enabler for future existence and growth for both financial institutions and also the clients and businesses. So it's just basic business sense. And I think Gareth said, it's really just a strategic advantage as well. So after this discussion and after this event, the whole banking sector made a commitment to develop and implement a set of national sustainable finance principles um, that were adopted by the entire banking sector in 2015. And we are very proud that despite the fact that there is still no central bank regulation that mandates banks to do sustainable finance, all of the banks just implement them on a voluntary basis. And they report to us, the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Association, every six months about the sustainability performance. Um, now the central bank has also picked this up and uh, they're collecting green loan statistics from the banking sector. And now most of the banks are really actively developing on various green finance products in different sectors. And also together as an industry, we're currently working with the government and the Green Climate Fund on the setup of a national green bank that will really provide financing for green projects at a much larger scale and at uh, a more affordable rate. And along the road, um, we have also realized that, of course, banks, uh, even though they make up a larger part of the financial sector, are just part of the solution, but the entire financial system and the business sector needed to be mobilized, including insurance, capital markets, institutional investors, and so on. So in light of that, we also developed the National Sustainable Finance Strategy in 2017, covering the entire financial sector, describing ways of how the market, both the market and also the government can drive more uh, positive change in, in the country. And starting from a few years back, we are now actively implementing various projects, initiatives around building a green bond market, introducing ESG um, considerations into the stock exchange policies, developing financial regulations and policies such as a green taxonomy um, that are aligned with our sustainability agenda. And what I found very interesting was also that this work that we have done in the banking sector is now also inspiring other business communities. So the construction sector is coming together, the, the Kashmir sector is coming together, and also other countries like Cambodia and Kyrgyzstan were inspired by this Mongolia story, and they're just coming together to develop their own sustainability standards, drive sustainability from the bottom up with a market-based approach. So even in a country where you have a government that is not so active on these sustainability policies, you can see that this is happening um, with change driven, driven from the market itself. And um, as a person that has really seen firsthand how finance can advance sustainability. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone, the organizers here today and the participants for taking part in this important discussion. And secondly, um, I just wanted to say that the power that we have as financial and business professionals is just endless. And so please use it proactively and ignite change wherever you are. So um, I, I, I have been, I have dedicated my whole career working on sustainable finance and all the changes that I'm seeing in the country is really inspiring for me. And I just really hope every young financial professional that is working in this field will also support this agenda going forward. So um, thanks a lot for, for this uh, opportunity again, and I'm happy to share more insights during the panel and discussion. Thank you so, so much, Namandari. I think you know, over 80% of the attendees and myself as well are extremely motivated to drive the sustainability, you know, agenda forward. But oftentimes when you're motivated to do something, it's really demotivating to hear that you have to provide a business case for it. You're like, why do I need to tell you that this is an investment? You should just understand that we need to do this for business good. And so that demotivates me all the time, but hopefully the past 45 minutes have proven to all of you that there's not just, you know, an honest reason why we need to do good. There's a business case for doing good. So thank you so much for showing us that. And I look forward to hearing more from you from the panel. All right. And thank you. Thank you all for all our speakers and the, their stories. And we've just sprinted through the keynotes and I know we'll be heading into uh, our panel discussion shortly, but just as a reminder for our attendees, in case you forgot, um, we are hosting a 20 minute panel before we hear from our last speaker, 
And thank you for all the questions you've been sharing throughout the event and before the event. Um, we'll try to answer some of those right now and a few more in our extended Q&A after party later on. So to delve into the panel, uh, our first question is, what are the main emerging benchmarks to assess corporate progress when it comes to doing good? Um, Gareth, I'm gonna throw that one to you first. Oh, thanks for that. Um, a great question. Uh, there's a couple of things for me. There's, there's some hard elements. I'd say there's some softer elements. I mean, on the, on the hard benchmarking side, I touched on it earlier. Rating agencies are coming out with a very clear path to grade a corporation's ESG agenda. That will absolutely go to value. Okay, so there is a very clear, uh, obvious route. The other ones, when you look at, again, in the US, when you look at the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, again, there is value creation that sits behind that. And you can clearly see, again, I touch on something Kate said earlier, those companies that are embedded in that and are doing well are those that have got the highest market caps right now. So these things combine and give you a real sense, you know, certainly for, um, for private sectors. To me, there's, there's a slightly softer element around this as well, and it comes back more to a generational perspective. You all joining us today have a choice and opportunity and fantastic skills and energy to deploy wherever you want. As an employer, I want to attract that, harness that, and to retain it and utilize it for good. You will choose companies that are doing more along the, the doing good route than those that don't. Okay, so from a corporation survival perspective and to continue to, continue to innovate and survive, the recruitment and ability to attract and retain talent is absolutely embedded in this as well. And I think understanding that and underpinning some of these fundamentals, again, merging trends right now will then you know, come off the back of that and it will be kind of corporations make or break success, I'd say. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Nomandari, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that from a, the, the perspective of a developing country. With, with everything that you've done in Mongolia, can you tell us a little bit more about what emerging benchmarks would you use to assess corporate progress when it comes to doing good? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jaline, for the question. I, I think, I mean, as, as Gareth mentioned, uh, obviously, globally, we have the UN standards, TCFD, SASB, CDP, a lot of different emerging best practices that are really good benchmarks that um, corporations and businesses can use. Uh, but what we have done in Mongolia, for example, is to also develop uh, mostly these benchmarks that we have in the country are also aligned with international best practices. But we also do develop our own benchmark that are also aligned with our unique country context and, and needs. So for example, if you look at the textile sector in Mongolia, we have the Kashmir industry that's very important. And then we look at the livestock management, pasture ledge management, and these kind of things, which are not usually reflected in also international standards. So we kind of also align, with, align it with our local kind of uh, unique needs. And on this one, uh, a major kind of flagship project that we finished two years ago, for example, is, is the development of a national green taxonomy. Uh, of course, it's not really a direct benchmark of, of how good corporates are, but it's a really useful measurement tool that the entire financial sector and the business sector right now is using to identify green projects and have a common language around what we could finance as uh, that we consider green and, and sustainable. Uh, but I think the main challenge that we are facing right now, especially in a developing country, is data availability, definitely. And then in all of these standards measurement frameworks, there should also be science-based methodologies and criteria that should be attached to it. And that's something that we're still working on. But I think uh, in overall, there's a lot of progress globally that uh, corporations can just use and, and learn from. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nomandari. And, and Mara, same question to you. It's very much from a kind of investigative audit perspective, you know, what benchmarks are emerging that people can use to measure corporate progress? Sure. So, you know, both things that Gareth and Nomandari mentioned were kind of the rating agencies and those higher level topics. And those topics are really important, but they also need to boil down to some of the specifics. So the ratings agencies are pulling in both quantitative and qualitative information that companies are putting out there. So from a qualitative perspective, it's really important to be able to articulate what your strategy is around sustainability issues, understanding what the risks as well as the opportunities are for the organization. And then from a quantitative perspective, setting goals like science-based targets around climate, 
uh, like um, ethnic or, or gender diversity within your organization and what are you trying to achieve? Because right now, as we're still evolving standards and evolving the rules around this reporting, it's really important to be able to, mostly to show progress and to show that you are making an impact as opposed to um, necessarily having the comparative information. That's ideally where we're going, but we aren't quite there yet. And until that gets all sorted out and um, everybody is on board and using the same standards and frameworks, um, those are the, the best ways that we're seeing companies address. Thank you, thank you for that. And very much staying in line with standardization and frameworks and even just language. Um, Gareth, this question is for you. What language or terminology do you use you know, in your position as a CFO when speaking to other members of the leadership team about sustainable development that really resonates and gets their attention? Yeah, I, I think to me, it's daily language. I come back, you know, the sustainable development agenda is a daily part of doing business and it's not a separate activity. That is the one thing that I want to make sure it is, is clear. So when you're using the, the terminology and the language, to me, it just talks about good business sense. And we talk about, again, the right level of the quality of earnings that you want, um, talking about the portfolio and some diversification, whether that be on the investment side, think about how much spend you've got in certain activities, and also because it's so pertinent and topical, as I said, around the broader ESG agendas, helping, uh, to me, the, the biggest item is not necessarily language and terminology, but actually setting goals, whether they be firm or soft in nature, just as Mara said, is actually the first stepping stone to get there. It feels incredibly uncomfortable. And I think that's why you're not seeing that unless you're forced into it. How do I kind of pick that and where do I want to go? Again, coming back to this strategic intent is absolutely key. So for me, it's about bringing that agenda regularly, consistently, and helping to kind of bring that tone from the top to help to set that strategic imperative, help to set some of those targets and goals, and then be able to kind of uh, embed that and cascade that through the organization. Right, right. Yeah, completely true. And, and that cascading of, of goals throughout the organization really starts from setting that tone at the top and kind of bringing things down. So Mara, I'd love to hear overall, how do you see executive leadership starting to shift their focus away from solely focusing on profit maximization, as Gareth mentioned earlier, to more of a longer term generational vision of sustainable growth? I think the most meaningful thing that I've seen and, and shift in behavior is actually tying management compensation to achieving certain goals around sustainability within the organization. So there's now a component of both short-term and long-term goals of, of uh, management comp and executive comp um, being built into how, you know, in, in, in order to encourage behavior change within the organization, I feel like you know, attaching dollars to this, which is a lot of what we've been talking about from a finance perspective, um, really does ultimately change behavior. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, to our attendees, thank you to our panel. And, and, and this brings us to the end of our panel discussion. I, I always wish we could have more time during these panels, especially with this amazing group of speakers. Thank you for your brilliant insights. You know, I've gained a huge deal of information from our short time together. I'm sure our attendees have as well. Um, for those of you who can stay on, please do. Please stick around for our extended Q&A. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Carla to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Shalene. And I think what's really important about the panel too is we talk so much about setting goals and setting kind of like those statistics, but as employees and as just citizens, we need to make sure that we're holding these companies accountable for those goals, right? And so just telling me that you're gonna set this goal does not make it enough. We have to hold them accountable. Um, so before we head into our extended Q&A session, we're gonna hear from Michael Itza for some closing remarks. Michael is the chairman of Chartered Accountants Worldwide and the CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. I clearly cannot say the word chartered at all. <laughs> he is a powerful, forward-thinking force in the world of accounting and has an unshakable belief in the power of young leaders to drive forward uh, positive change. Over to you, Michael. Well, wherever you are in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'd, um, I'd like to start with a few uh, thank yous. So first of all, uh, thank you and congratulations to Carl and Shaleen for doing a great job 
in hosting this webinar today. We're not finished yet, but you're certainly uh, infecting us all with your enthusiasm. So that's, that's terrific. And I'd like to thank all the speakers as well for their inspirational stories and the great examples that they've shared with us. And I'd like to come back to some of those points in a minute. Um, particular thank you to the AICPA and IFAC for hosting this event, and also to One Young World and Chartered Accountants Worldwide for the entire FinBiz 2030 Building Resilience Series, because their commitment to mobilize the finance and business community to tackle the UN Sustainability Development Goals has never been more important and has never been more timely. So let me just reflect for a moment on some of the things that uh, I took away from what the, the speakers said. Well, Kate kicked us off in the way that only Kate can. Uh, I think Kate's uh, enthusiasm is infectious. And she reminded us that the sustainability rocket has taken off. And, uh, you know, we, we all need to hold on to it because it's changing the world. Next, we heard from Paul, and Paul, um, I thought, reminded us uh, very appropriately uh, when this is being based in the home of the world's largest capital market of what Larry Fink said. And Larry Fink is one of those rare individuals who does have the power to shape and markets listen when he speaks. And he told us, and he's told us on several occasions now, that the whole world of finance is being reshaped. And we better take notice of that, because if we don't, we're going to get left behind. I think it's also important that Paul reminded us that US disclosures around this area are now accelerating. And just to show that FinBiz 2030 is about international themes and different countries working together, some of you may be interested to know that yesterday the United Kingdom announced its own consultation into making um, climate disclosures using the TCFD model. That's the uh, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures that was led by Mark Carney and Mary Shapiro. Uh, they're consulting on making that mandatory for all listed companies in the UK. And that's ahead of COP26. That's going to be a game changer. Next, we heard from Maura, uh, who shared her story and um, reminded us that throughout her career, whatever she's been doing, she's remained connected to her passions and never lost sight of the fact that she wanted to make a difference. And today, everything that we do can be seen through an ESG lens. Um, she reminded us of three things, knowing your purpose, leveraging your skills and network, and whatever adversity you, you encounter, don't give up, keep at it. Resilience is incredibly important. Next, we heard from Gareth, and Gareth reminded us about the quality of earnings being important, but how important that had become to him and his company in the importance of capital allocation. And the quality of earnings is very much embedded now in their credit rating. Gareth also gave us his three thoughts about thinking long-term, lowering capital cost and risk, and always looking at the strategic opportunities. And Gareth, I was very taken by your enthusiasm for hydrogen because I've been very passionate about hydrogen and its ability to be an important component within the replacement of the carbon economy for a number of years. So I'm absolutely with you on that. And then finally, we heard from Nomindari. And I thought for the final speaker, you were very candid about the need for performance to follow the rhetoric. And it's not always the case that those two things are aligned. And I thought you told a very powerful story about how the finance sector has now become mobilized in Mongolia. And we must remember that countries and economies are moving at different speeds. And sometimes developing economies and mature economies 
can be some way apart uh, on their journey and the progression through it. Now, throughout this whole series, we've heard an awful lot about the importance of determination. People have talked about purpose. They've talked about attitude. They've talked about positivity. But perhaps one of the themes that comes up more than any other is the need for resilience. And as a leader, I would suggest that all, to all of you that resilience is key to address the challenges of the SDGs, particularly in the 10 years we've got in front of us. I think we've also seen very clearly today the difference that young leaders can play and the astonishing impact that smart, driven young people can have in influencing and affecting change. Now, the opportunity exists right now for finance and for business to bring in the sustainability development goals as part of the recovery plans from the pandemic. And what we must do from here is build more resilient and sustainable economies. But to do that, we have to be prepared to push the boundaries and we have to help the business world to rise to the challenge of sustainable development. We face global challenges. No country can do this alone. And to do this, we must work together. Overcoming them requires international collaboration. And I think that's where you all come in. Having a global platform such as FinBiz 2030, along with networks like One Young World, Chartered Accountants Worldwide, IFAC, and AICPA to facilitate the collaboration and to drive action is absolutely vital. So in conclusion, I mean, I hope that the audience we have today has found this event as inspirational as I have. And that if we were to ask again how you feel about these areas, I mean, Carla took your, uh, took your early uh, um, uh, views on this at the start with the polls, I hope that you're more encouraged and motivated than ever to take action as a result of this. Now, FinBiz is not just about one event today. I hope that you'll be inspired to be part of the FinBiz global community and that you'll join us on future webinars and events. And the next FinBiz 2030 webinar is on the 27th of April. Now, that's actually one that the ICAW is hosting. And I'm particularly excited about it because we're going to be joined by one of the UK government ministers that's actually working on COP26. And it's going to focus on global leadership and local action towards tackling climate change. As I sign off, I'm looking forward to seeing how you, as young leaders, can all use your talent and your drive and shape the future. So thank you very much. And let me hand back to, to Carla and Shaleen. Thank you so much, Michael, for that perfect conclusion and for giving us the optimism that I think we all need to drive forward the work in our organizations. Today has honestly been an exceptional opportunity to hear from a range of uh, our respected people in our fields. And we're so grateful for each of you to, for joining us. And we're really grateful for everybody and all the participants who signed today to hear us speak. We truly hope that what you've learned today will help you move the needle in the right direction and that each and every one of you can catalyze change wherever you are in the world and whatever your role is. We urge you to leave with courage and challenge yourself to act on what you've heard today. We will now be wrapping up before we head to the extended Q&A after party for the next 15 minutes. If you can't stick around, it's totally fine. We'll wrap up after the event and we'll send you some key takeaways. If you can, we look forward to seeing you. And as Carla mentioned earlier, just like we have in the UK, South Africa and Ireland and soon Nigeria, we will be launching a task force in the US to lead initiatives driving forward the sustainable development agenda here. So if you're interested in stepping up and participating, please keep an eye on your inbox. We'll be sending you an email with details on this and the upcoming events after this session. Uh, but please also remember what Michael said, we have our next Building Resilience event on April 27th, focused on climate action.
Thank you again to our speakers and our viewers once again for taking the time to join us and for engaging with us on social media using the hashtag FinBiz2030 and tagging us in your post. Please make sure to keep that going. And a final thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our co-hosts IFAC and AICPA and to our partners at Big Top Multimedia and A1 for bringing this event to life today. If you, as our attendees, would like to stick around for the after show Q&A session, please do stay with us. We encourage you to do so. And for those of you who have to go, we'll miss you and we look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone. It was so great having you. And thank you, Shalane. Good. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm trying to really work with them closely to let them understand there's a lot of opportunities in this area and they should just continue on and, and what they're passionate about. So that's also another thing that, that I'm trying to work on. But I um, would love to hear also from the others about yeah, what they're doing personally. This. Thank you. Yeah, no, Mandara, it's, it's the same for me. I think that point you said around the mentoring and just creating time to listen is so important, you know, particularly, as you said, to create avenues for either employees or outside just to have that voice. And for me, it's refreshing, even on this panel, um, you know, with, with the expertise that you guys have got, but just more broadly, just to hear people's views and perspectives, because that's what's going to open up your mindset and, and open up new avenues. So taking the time to listen and, and, and get motivation from others' passion around the topic is absolutely key. And I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, and they are pushing my husband and I to make, you know, personal changes on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we do basic things like composting. Um, we only own one car, so we try to walk or use uh, public transportation as much as possible. We're thinking about um, going electric and, and buying an electric vehicle. So things like that, you know, we're, we're seeing the next generation really concerned about climate change and concerned about the choices that we're making on a day-to-day -day basis. So trying to examine those choices and, and, and make, um, make changes. Thank you so much. And I actually have a personal follow-up question to you on, on some of these questions. So I mentioned this earlier, but I find it really difficult and I find it really demotivating when I have to explain to people why there is a business case to doing good. And so maybe you guys can explain in your personal lives, obviously you're surrounded by so many people who you don't have to pitch why sustainability is important, but how do you get over that hump when somebody just does not get it and you still have to kind of explain why sustainability is important? Do any of you deal with that at all? Or is it just me who has to <laughs> pitch to people why? <laughs> oh, no, you're not alone. Um, absolutely <laughs> not. It, I still think that there's, there's massive degrees of education and knowledge here. And to me, that's always the biggest barrier because people pigeonhole and bucket sustainability in a tree-hugging, eco-friendly uh, item and just almost write it off before you get there. And I think having to... And, and you're not alone. I, I've had to do this a number of times just to take a big step back, apply a little bit of empathy um, in terms of how the person might be looking at it and bring them along the journey with you is key. And I think this is the, we're in this interim phase. You see a lot of people um, like you all and everyone that's joined with the passion, the energy and the education that is advanced and those that are still lagging. Over time, that will build up. But I think just you know, using that bit of education and let's say, you know, when you get there, I'm hoping, Carla, you see kind of the light bulb moment for people finally switch, although it's kind of frustrating. But it, it does make sense. It is absolute common sense and just good practice when you put it into the right context. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. So we have a few more questions from our viewers. So the first is driving change in a business environment can be really challenging. How do you keep yourself motivated and focused on your passion when your managers aren't being supportive? So I think that kind of goes with my question, but maybe it's more specific to your actual managers or people that you report to. Does anyone have a, a start there? Maybe Mara, I saw yourself go on mute. <laughs> Um, so I think it goes back to uh, some of the things that I had said in, 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 um, when I spoke, but really just kind of pinpointing what it is your passion is and what you really care about and what ultimate outcome you're trying to drive to and just holding on to that and remembering that because you're going to have really hard days. You're going to have to slog through the details. You're going to be, you know, um, engaging in difficult conversations, sometimes trying to convince people of your way or, or really just. Um, you know, knowing that you're not going to get anywhere. And um, it's, it's really understanding what the outcome is that you're driving towards and to know that the way you're spending your time is really valuable and it's really worthwhile and it will have a, a beneficial outcome. Even if it is only in an individual's life, I can't tell you the number of times I've just had individual conversations with people that I thought were not going to be meaningful and, and really kind of ultimately change their um, you know, the way that they act and they behave in the world and, and change the, the outcome of, of their career. Awesome. Thank you. Maybe just to add to what Mara said, I mean, I, I just try to remind myself about one thing that 
if it's not going to happen today, for sure it will happen tomorrow. I mean, there's no option B right now, right? There's no going back anyway. So even if, if you're not seeing the change that you want right today, I mean, just be a little bit more persistent and just keep on the work. But definitely it will come at some point. At the, and when it happens, you will be very reward about it. So I just try to keep myself motivated also in, in that way. And definitely, I mean, I also see a lot of resistance, the resistance and a lot of questions about why this should happen. And I mean, in, in a country like Mongolia, when you speak about sustainability, it's usually the first question that comes from the CEOs is, is it going to cost me additional, you know, extra cost? Uh, do you need me to hire another new person? I mean, how much time is this going to take? But uh, what I try to let them understand is that it, it's not going to cost anything in addition, but it's just going to cost a bit different than how you used to do business before. So if you just plan it in advance as, as much as possible, I mean, there will not be any major additional cost, but it's just a little bit different approach. So if you understand it that way, I think it, it will be fine. So, I mean, these were some of the conversations that I had and it worked so far, but I think it really depends on who you're speaking to and then also understanding what for that person is really important and what, what would relate to that person. So the little bit different strategies that I use, but in general, I think that's also one thing, yeah, that I've seen that worked. Those are incredibly helpful tips. I think I'm hearing just making sure you're speaking their language, uh, which I think is a good sales tactic across the board. So thank you. All right. So I think we have one final question and I know we have a little bit of time to be a few answers, but so in a situation of very limited resources and security challenges, how can small businesses sustain their survival? Maybe Gareth, do you want to start off with that one? Yeah. Um, Incredibly difficult, but it comes back. I think if I come all the way back to what I said at the start, to me, it's always about um, trying to make the smart choice, which isn't obviously the, the obvious choice always, but trying to think smart about how you deploy those limited resources is obviously key. And in terms of, again, a couple of words that have been said before, resilience, flexibility, and really, I guess, for, for a lot of small businesses, and you think of the turmoil that we've gone through over the last 12 months, how smaller businesses have been able to innovate, find a niche, capture an opportunity has really been the difference between those that have got a fantastic platform and, and sustainable growth and those that have really, really struggled. So I think making the smart choice, which is often sometimes the gut feel choice, and thinking about how you can ensure that you've got flexibility and, and, and innovation um, is probably going to be some of the key differentiators. Perfect. Thank you. No, Mandari, Mara, do either of you want to anything to that? No pressure if you don't, you're all, all going to think it was a very holistic answer. All right, perfect. I mean, listen, I, I know I speak for everyone when I say you guys have made me even more passionate, and motivated about the topic. I think for myself, just being able to speak to people more clearly about the business case for doing good, I think is, is so important. And hopefully we can all kind of take that away from today's session. Um, so the after show Q&A has so sadly come to an end. Thank you to each of you for sticking around and asking all of your questions. Please give a virtual round of applause to these three exceptional individuals for their leadership and taking the time to join us today, especially from such a late hour um, in Mongolia, which is very impressive. So thank you so much. And we've had such a great engagement, you know, from all of you on the chat, and on social media. And as we said earlier, please keep on posting, please keep on tagging us using the hashtag FinBiz2030. And, and just remember more details about the launch of the US task force is coming and other events are also coming soon, especially coming up to our event on climate action on April 27th. So please keep an eye out for follow-up communications Thank you for joining us today in your busy, busy schedules to talk about something that is so important and so impactful. Take care, be well, and thank you to Carlo, my gracious co-host today, and thank, and you, so thank much. you to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have an incredible Bye. day, night, morning, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody.